The very first germ of the book came from my buying some wool to knit this scarf with. Now I can't show you a, a, a single strand of it, perhaps there was a little bit of a strand of it. You can see that these, it has these little bubbles that happen every little while. It's also quite furry. Um, it comes in three different colours all sort of mixed together. There's a green and a purple and a, and a blue-green. And when I was shopping for it, I looked at it and, and it reminded me so much of seaweed that the thought of knitting with seaweed, and probably the impossibility of that really, um, was attractive to me. And I thought, I th I thought about um, what you would be doing if you would be knitting something out of seaweed, if you actually took the trouble to find out how to do it. And I made these notes in my book in the middle of 2005. The, I had the, the, f the first sentence almost of the book. Um, that old witch Miss Caletha was down on the beach knitting up seaweed on her iron needles. There was something about the iron needles which also set the mood of it. In the end, she doesn't use iron needles. In the end, she uses a kind of a, a bone crochet hook, really. But thinking about her sitting there with her iron needles knitting up this seaweed and knitting it up into something large um, was was what set me off uh, and I've got she's knitting blankets that can be thrown over selkies so that was the that was that was probably the the first thing that made me start it started throwing up all the questions for me about why she would be doing this, what these things would be used for. I knew that they would have to do with selkies, I wanted them to be something magical, I knew that she would be a witch. Um, so how was she making her living making these blankets? Why was she doing this? What was going on? I have to, I'm, I'm going, to, going to give some qualifications for these words, but they're basically brooding, romantic, stark, gorgeous, and atmospheric. Now, I don't want people to be misled by the word romantic. There's a lot of material about love and relationships in here, but this is not a romance. Um, atmospheric is a very bland word for the kind of thing that I was trying to find a word for, um, which is you never lose the sense that you're isolated on this island. Um, the other three words that I, I nearly put here instead of atmospheric are sea-washed, wind-blown and storm-tossed. And I thought atmospheric sort of was a good catch-all for all of those words. Well, I originally thought that the story in the novella would be the central story and that I would do a lot of little stories around it um, that would uh, be sparked off by it at, rather than rather than form a con continuous whole but when I started writing those stories I started getting into the reasons why that first story had happened where the magic came from um, how the witch had organized for their for, for all the the island women, the real island women, the red-haired island women, to leave the island and be replaced entirely by these selkie women. So the logistics of that story fascinated me and the reasons why she would have done this to the village were became the important questions in the book. Well, Miss Kayla, with her, with her knitting, with her bad temper, uh, with her terrifying visage and her adventures um, on the mainland and on the island, um, as, a, as a figure in the village, she was fascinating. As a figure in the story, she was really the one that held it all together. And I found that as soon as I started tying the different viewpoints to her, it, it became the novel that it is. She was really, she was really the core of it. She's the one who, where all the emotional intensity began. Yeah. I write, I've been told that I write fairly fast. When I talk about the actual wordage that I, that I get through, um, I seem to, seem to write quite fast. Um, I think this is part of the just trying to keep anxiety at bay, just uh, throwing yourself right into the story and not having 
a little voice from behind you telling you what's wrong as you go. So just push everything aside, plunge in and forge on. I don't write every day um, because I've found that when I've had spells of writing every day without a break that I tend to uh, get very tired of the sound of my own voice, get very stale. Um, but I do, uh, when I'm working on a draft, I, you know, that is necessary. I'll take a day off a week, but, um, but I do have to, to write every day uh, when I've got something in train. Um, I relax and try to enjoy the process as much as possible. Um, so I try and make choices that will be the most fun to follow up. And by fun, I mean being so involved in a story that um, I won't notice the time flying by. So I'll be in the flow, I'll reach the end of the writing day and I'll feel as if I've actually been some, someone else and been somewhere else all day. I've been in that story world watching things happen or making things happen. So keep all the fearful critical voices out of my head, but also also be prepared to uh, slash and burn and rewrite from scratch if that's going to serve the story better eventually. I like a story that's intense. I like to read a story that's intense. I like um, I like to I like my reading to feel as if it is taking me somewhere new. Taking me somewhere in uncomfortable is even better. You don't quite get the feel the same feeling writing it as you read it. So sometimes it's only when you get up and read a chunk that you never have read aloud and you start to realise what it's all about that you realise how intense it is. Because when you're working on the, the technical aspects of it, trying to make it work as that tear-jerking thing, it's not usually doing that to you. Sometimes it does, but mostly it doesn't. Mostly you're too close in and working too hard on building towards the point of emotional catharsis to, to really be affected yourself. It is quite cold-blooded that way. Um, and that's one of those things that's just so absorbing to do, just the craft of getting that right and not putting a foot wrong, not breaking people out of that, that state of moving towards the tears or the pleasure or the wonder that's in that scene. You know how you sometimes have those really intense dream experiences that, that sort of cast, a, cast their feeling through the following day. So, you know, halfway through the afternoon you'll be thinking, why, why, why does everything feel so strange? Or, or why does everything have a melancholy edge? Or why does everything have this, this gleam about it today? And it's because of the sort of after effects of that dream that don't go away. Well, with this, with this story, I want people to, to take away kind of the smell of it. It's a very smelly book. The smell of those seaweed blankets and the smell of the morning sea wives and the, the sea and the wind in their hair. I want people to feel a bit sort of blown about by it and a bit, perhaps a bit confused by the end of it. But I want people to, to, to walk up and carry a little bit of that sort of storm-tossed atmosphere with them.